Thank you, Michael. Good afternoon, everyone. I know we're getting towards the end of the day, and Dalbert's kind of a um, brainy subject, but um, we'll try to move through it quickly. And, and if we, you have questions along the way, ask them, because I think we can all learn from them. Dalbert is now a reality for all of us, um, or at least it appears to be with the Senate Bill 3 passed in 2005, making reference to Dalbert and its progeny uh, for what the courts should look to. Prior to that, the courts in this state you know, it's basically, you know, a heartbeat and able, you know, to have some sort of grasp of the English language, and that has now apparently changed. Although the way in which it's been used in state court we've seen is is very different from the way it has been used in, uh, traditionally used in federal court. The Four Horsemen of Dauber. Um, someone told me once that it was the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. I couldn't believe that. I actually have to believe it's Arn and Ole Anderson, Tully Blanchard, and Ric Flair, the four horsemen of wrestling. But the four horsemen loosely refers to Daubert, who is the, the, the lead case, the Ric Flair of the, of the Daubert cases, Joyner, Kumo Tyre, and Wisegram. Um, those are the four cases from the Supreme Court that have really kind of outlined and, and, and crafted the way Daubert um, is applied in the federal courts. Now, what did it do? Well, here's the interesting thing. Before Daubert, we had Fry, which was a rigid general acceptance test. It was really strict. And Daubert came along and said, look, this doesn't jive with the liberal thrust of, of the rules of evidence. Um, and you know, we need a more relaxed approach. So we had a, they provided a looser framework. And they provided some details and some things to look at. But they, um, but they said, please do not treat these as, you know, you've got to look them in every case, you've got to weigh them in every case. They are all, um, you know, it's a case-by-case -case basis. And incredibly, what's happened is the federal courts have taken that, which is supposed to be a loosening of the expert standards, and have made it into uh, applying the standards more strictly and excluding experts more often under Daubert and its progeny. What they're supposed to do is the judges are supposed to examine the theory they're supposed to gather opposing facts about it and make a reasoned judgment of to what facts are correct. This here that I got an email statistic showed the teen pregnancy drops off significantly after the age of 25. I think that would probably pass Daubert muster. Um, but that's, that's all it is, is, you know, does it make sense? Are they coming out of left field? Is there actually anything you know, have they looked at this? Have they examined it? Is there any literature? And you don't always need literature. They don't always need to have laid hands on the patient. I mean, there, it, it should be a flexible approach, but it really should be a common sense. I mean, is this guy coming out of left field? Is he just, you know, wacky? Because the rest of it should be left to us as lawyers to get through impeachment or cross-examination and let the jury ultimately decide the weight of the evidence. What are the assumptions? The judges are to screen the testimony prior to trial. And, and again, common sense approach. Is there any data to support it? Um, you know, is it complex and cutting edge scientific principles? You know, but we're asking judges to do this, all right? And, and a lot of times, this is cutting edge medical stuff, cutting edge technology, design stuff, patent cases. Um, and that these judges are only supposed to allow appropriate science to be introduced to trial. The court should be flexible. Unfortunately, these uh, factors and outlines that the courts uh, were told in Daubert that they could consider have been uh, things that they've applied rigidly. Uh, any consideration of the admissibility on 702 must still be flexible. They should still have a flexible approach to this testimony, and they're not to use it as a checklist. And it's incredible. You read this, and you read what Rehnquist wrote in Daubert and said, guys, geez, you know, I'm afraid here that we're going to get in a slippery slope and they're going to start using this as a checklist. And you know, the opinion just says, don't do that. It's supposed to be looser. And we want to admit this testimony and leave it to the juries to decide the weight of this evidence. And unfortunately, it's been completely the opposite. Um, if it hasn't gained general acceptance, proponent may still establish it. That's the difference between Dalbert and Fry. At some point, somebody's going to look at something that nobody else has looked at before in a case. Maybe it's a failure mode that hasn't happened before, um, you know, or a design that nobody else has done. And there's not going to be any precedent for it. There's not going to be any articles. There's not going to be any testing. It's never happened before. And you can't have a general acceptance at that point. And what the Dalbert Court has said, and the way the 
federal courts and the state courts should apply it is, well, if it makes sense, it doesn't matter if there's general acceptance. Uh, it's kind of like when you apply for your first job and they want you to have experience you know, in order to get your job. Well, I need a job in order to get experience. You know, there's got to be the first person who does the first testing who looks at this and decides what to do. And that doesn't make it, per se, unreliable in and of itself. But what attorneys like to do is point out, well, nobody's ever said this before, and we've sold a million of these machines, and we've never had it reported any of this happening before. It shouldn't matter. If the science behind the expert's opinion is good science, and it's laid out uh, in a common sense manner, then it should be admissible, regardless of whether it's happened before or happened since, um, or whether it's generally accepted in the scientific community. And again, not all cases and experts can be analyzed under each of the criteria. Again, what, what was supposed to be something which was supposed to allow more experts' opinion in and allow the juries to do their role of weighing the evidence, weighing the different experts' opinions, you know, the battle of the experts has, judges have taken this and taken it upon themselves to, um, and not every judge, um, but since Daubert there's been an increase in the amount of judges that are willing to take this to weigh the evidence themselves and decide if they don't really like it or feel comfortable, then be the fact finder and exclude that expert. And that's inappropriate. The jury is still the proper trier of contested facts. They're the fact finder. They weigh the facts. And under Daubert, as written, and, and it's always good when you're doing these briefs or arguing it, is to go back to the source. Go back to Daubert and say, yes, I know the 11th Circuit has said this, this, and this. But it's crazy. Because when the Supreme Court decided this, and then when they talked about it in Joyner and Kuma, Tyre, and Weisgram, they said, no, 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 that's not what we're supposed to do. We're still supposed to let the jury decide if they believe these experts. All we're supposed to do is have a minimum gatekeeping role to make sure that we just don't have crazy evidence come in without any scientific basis. And we talk in the paper, we talk about um, different cases and different decisions that judges where they clearly become the fact finder. And when they don't feel real comfortable and they say, well, I understand that and I understand you are able to do that, but I don't really like the way you did it. I'm going to exclude it. That's not the way it should be applied. And, and unfortunately, the way Daubert has come down in, in the years since the decision is it has been applied disproportionately to strike the plaintiff's experts. Plaintiffs have the burden of proof. That means plaintiffs are going to have to have the expert witness. They're going to generally have to designate their expert witnesses first. Defendants can go to trial without an expert. They can just poke holes in yours. Um, we've actually had cases where a defendant will designate an expert. And if we feel comfortable that we can get what we need out of that expert, then we don't need to designate our own. But the reality is Daubert has been disproportionately used to strike plaintiff's experts. Um, I, I cite this case. The, the paper is almost, it, it, and I read it and reread it again, it's almost a little whiny. Um, oh, we're plaintiffs. We're always getting struck. We're always getting excluded on summary judgment. It's not fair. They're not mean to the defendants. Um, that's not across the board. It really is a generalization. But I, I cite this case. It was a very good recent case in the Ninth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals where the treating physician had looked at x-rays. It was a medical implant device case. And he said, look, I've worked with medical implants forever. They generally last anywhere from 10 to 20 years in the elbow. I've worked with these materials. I've looked at the x-rays. There's no misalignment here. Um, it's clearly a bad product because it shouldn't have worn out in eight months. Okay? The district court said, nah, sounds like recip, so to me, excludes it. And it goes up to the Ninth Circuit. The Ninth Circuit says, no, 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 no. That's not what we're supposed to do here. The guy looked at the x-rays. He's got an incredible amount of experience. He's worked with this stuff. He's able to say what he, through his experience, through hundreds if not thousands of elbow implants, he should expect. And clearly that this eight months that this worked, or that, that the device failed um, was something outside the norm. He's allowed to say that, and then we'll let the jury decide whether they think that truly is a defect or not. Um, so if anyone wants the, the site, I actually have the case on here. I can email it to you as well. Um, and the other uneven application, and this is true, is the Daubert cocktail. It does only affect plaintiffs. Now, what is the Daubert cocktail? All right, here's what you do as a defense attorney. Um, and this happened to us very recently with somebody sitting in the room. You file a motion for summary judgment. You file a motion to exclude the plaintiff's experts, okay? 
And part of your summary judgment motion is, judge, you should have already excluded their experts because their opinions are unreliable under Daubert. Now that you've done that, they don't have any expert testimony to prove this and that, summary judgment is, is appropriate, okay? Now the reason this is so dangerous for plaintiffs, and only plaintiffs can succumb to this uh, on summary judgment, is <clears throat> you have no expert, you have no case, all right? And it effectively imposes summary judgment if your expert gets included. And here's where you're really in trouble. And then you get to appeal. And the, the Court of Appeals, whether it's in Georgia or a federal Court of Appeals, the striking of the expert is, is an abuse of discretion standard, which is a tougher standard. Okay? And they can look at it and say, well, maybe we wouldn't have struck the expert, but we can't say the judge would be at their discretion. So the expert stays out. Then they look at it de novo without the expert's testimony and say, well, you don't have any expert testimony, the judge was right, uh, and weighing the facts, summary judgment was proper. And it's really, you, you end up in a really bad place if this happens to you, all right? So you've got to be aware at it, and we'll talk about how to avoid the, the Daubert cocktail, and that's what we call it. I don't know if that's actually something anyone else calls it, the Daubert cocktail, but that's, that's what we always call it. Um, Here's what we do, and we try to put this, especially in federal court, although I've seen a lot of state and superior court judges starting to require scheduling orders, uh, put it in there. Daubert motions have to be filed within the discovery period and before summary judgment motions are due. Uh, 30 days after you depose the expert, you have to file your Daubert motion. Try to get both sides to agree to it, and it really does benefit both sides, and, and, and here's why. It is a discovery issue. A expert disclosures under Rule 26, under the Georgia and the federal rules, um, and this should be something that both sides should have a chance to cure. It really should be a good faith. I think it's Judge Duffy in the Northern District that says this is a discovery issue. You should confer in good faith before you even move to strike an expert. And it gives both sides an opportunity to not have to go into trial without an expert. Hey, your guy should be excluded and here's why. And you have that good faith discussion. Now, we actually had this recently in a med medical malpractice case. We said, your expert's nuts. He shouldn't be able to testify. And the defense agreed, and they withdrew him. And then they disclosed an expert after discovery expired. So we're fighting that battle now. But, but it does help both sides. So put in the order a time period before discovery expires, or 30 days after the deposition, or well before summary judgment motions are due, that Daubert motions have to be filed. And that's one helpful way to try to not have the Daubert cocktail. Don't have them mixed in the same drink. Same time, rule, reasonable time after the Rule 26 report or deposition of an expert, I think we try 30 days. And I think we usually say 30 days after the uh, transcripts received, because it's tough to write a motion without a transcript from the expert. And again, allow for amendment securing of new experts. This really does benefit both sides. Um, both sides can get caught with their pants down when it comes to to experts and designating experts. And what can you do? Prepare and vet your experts. Just like a vice presidential candidate from Alaska or wherever, make sure you know what you're dealing with, all right? Go and look. Look at their CV. Where do they go to school? What kind of degrees do they have? Is it a, literally a statistician who is testifying as to uh, life expectancy after reviewing medical records? Well, that's not right. The statistician doesn't know how to read medical records. Um, Look at the CV. Look at where they, what degrees they hold. And then we'll talk a little bit later about where you can search to find. Have they been excluded before? What have their opinions been in the past? Is this consistent? Or is this just a person like, you know, some accident reconstructionist I know we have in this state who will say the light was green and then the exact same case say the light is red, depending on who's writing a check. It's not the kind of expert you want, all right? If you've got a good case and you've, uh, you vetted the case appropriately, then do the same with your expert and, and make sure they're not going to get you in trouble because they're going out on a limb where they shouldn't be or that they've gone there before. Has the theory been tested or can it be tested? Ask that of your expert. I mean, when you're interviewing an expert, don't just sign the contract and sign them up and, hey, you're cool and you're going to give me an opinion. Talk to them about this. How, what, why, where? When have you done this? What are the rates of error? Has it been subject to peer review? Have you written an article? Has anyone written an article? And again, there are sometimes instances where, no, there's no articles or anything on this because it's a one in a million thing. Um, we had that with a client who had a 
fell off a rail car and bumped his head, literally bumped his head like a goose egg on his head, and had complete and total retrograde amnesia. And our expert said, it's real. And their expert said, yeah, it's real. Uh, and then they differed on what caused it. But the reality is, we found an article from France. There was like three other people in the world who this had documented happened to. But it didn't make it any less real. Um, so talk to about this. See, search for yourself. Go, you know, there's a lot of medical uh, review articles online. Be curious about your case and be curious about your experts, and it'll help you down the road. And consider the expert's testimony as it relates to each of these. All right, what are they going to say about has it been tested? Can they test it? What are they going to say about peer review and articles and have they reviewed it? Do they have experience in this area, et cetera? How do you address the Dalbert factors? Start with qualifications. That's going to be really helpful if you have a qualified expert. Are they experienced in the field? Um, you know, in medical cases, you have to have somebody who's you know, a cardiologist basically for a cardiologist, unless it's an ER case or something like that. But is this relevant knowledge? Are they, are they reaching, you know, you wouldn't want me to write your w w will. I don't know anything about writing a will, so don't hire me as an expert on wills. But if it's a personal injury case, then that's something I can do and I've done before and I can give you my CV and cases and successes and appellate decisions and all that kind of stuff. Think of your experts the same way. Do they have experience in the field? Where, who have they testified previously? It's, you're literally hiring an employee. Talk to references. How did they testify? What was their prior testimony? What were their prior opinions? Have them send you their Rule 26 reports. And then the methodology. Make it look like a scientific paper. Go through the scientific method. You know, here's my hypothesis and analysis and conclusions and what do you base it on and reference it and talk about textbooks. Make sure the Rule 26 report looks good and it will pass muster. And I put in there, uh, if they're professors, explain how they teach this method, what textbooks they use, et cetera. I teach uh, engineering at Georgia Tech and I use Jimmy's book on the scientific method and how you design products. And in that, in chapter four, it says you have to go through the design criteria and you have to decide, you know, good design. And if you can't design everything else away, then you have to guard against it. And if you can't guard against it, you have to warn against it. And so that their opinions follow, you know, something accepted um, and, and all right, something accepted um, in, in the community and in the scientific community. And if they follow that, then you're more likely to have a reliable opinion that's going to be admissible in court. Motion in limine. Um, we've done this before. If they don't file a motion to strike your expert under Daubert, file a motion in limine and say, my expert is qualified and should um, have their opinions admitted at trial. And the advantage of this is, first of all, you're not waiting at the 11th hour, especially in state court, um, when they can file. I had a case recently, Monday morning at trial, picking a jury, Daubert motion on my lap. Um, you know, that's, that's not anything you want to have to be worrying about right before you strike a jury. What do you call the motion? The motion in anti-eliminate? No, we just call it a motion in limine. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I think we've called it for a motion uh, on the admissibility of expert testimony. <laughs> and the reality is if you file your motion first, then you also get two bites of the apple. You also get the reply brief, which is very helpful. But it brings it to a head early. You'll know what you're doing. If you're in state court and you file this, and your expert gets excluded and you don't have a pretrial order yet, then designate another expert, because you can. Um, but you want to deal with this early, because you don't want it to be a surprise. You don't want the judge to say, oh, the judge actually almost excluded this expert neurologist who was a treating doc in my case. Um, I guess it was Tuesday before she was supposed to testify. And uh, you know that would have been bad. Uh, <laughs> Do what? Well, a motion on the admissibility of expert testimony. Was well, that an understatement? It wouldn't have made a difference. Oh, well. <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, yeah, then you, then you go ahead and can, can eliminate some of this stuff. Talk about the qualifications. Clearly, he's qualified, and here's why. And have the judge rule on it. Um, and then you'll have left, less to go through in front of a jury. And how can plaintiff's attorneys use this offensively? Defendants pick bad experts just like we do. They have experts as, 
especially in medical malpractice cases, who will say anything um, under the guise of, you know, I'm testifying for a doctor. Strike those experts. Move, use this as a sword, not just as a shield against your experts. It can be very, very effective. Um, it applies to defense in med mal cases. Again, we have been pretty successful in, in, in doing this against experts who are, you know, bad apples. Um, and it forces them to put up the case before trial, to show their hand, to, to give you more information. Um, if you're in federal court, insist on a case list of their cases. If you're in state court, serve them with a notice to produce at your deposition and make them produce a case list. Um, we will get, uh, you know, they should have to give you all their testimony. And then the courts, you know, are always apt to split, split the baby. If you file a motion to strike and they file a motion to strike, a lot of times the court just saying, nah, I'm not going to strike either of them. Well, real quickly. So ver vet your experts, Dalbert Tracker, Dalbert on the Wed, Trial Smith, look at cases where they testified. Look at Westlaw. Help them prepare their report. Walk through them. Look at the judge's prior rulings in other cases where your expert's been struck or has testified and has been ruled admissible. And use affidavits to supplement their testimony. Just because the defense attorney asks a really bad question and they don't ask the right questions doesn't mean your expert can't say it. So supplement with an affidavit. Hey, he didn't even ask me why I did this or that or the other, and supplement it with an affidavit. Is it worth the trouble digging up prior testimony? Real quickly, and Michael will enjoy this. We had an expert who, his name is up there, and we found a deposition. The guy almost always testified for plaintiffs, and we found a deposition where he, uh, or in our case, he was designated to testify against us for the defense. And so in his prior case on the right, we said he had testified that I don't know if he would have had a chalk a car. This basically put a wedge underneath the wheels. Um, I would have checked the handbrake, saw it was tight. I wouldn't have chalked it. Well, do you feel that it should have been chalked before it was cut away from the others? No, I don't. And then in our case, well, two reasons. That the fact that I chalk cars, all cars anyway. You chalk all cars everywhere? I do. All right? The guy was completely diametrically opposed. Is it worth the trouble? Uh, oh, you're done, you're done. No, 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 real quickly. Um, <laughs> this one's good, because we're literally reading from this other deposition these questions. He had answered before, every railroader is worried about their job first and personal injury and safety second. And we ask him, well, would you agree that Mr. Jones, like every railroader, is worried about his job first and personal injury to other people second? I completely disagree with that. And then finally, uh, if I'm a conductor, I will crank that brake, and if it's tight, that brake's applied. And then in our case, he's, well, if they tighten it and the chain's tight, have they done their job? No. And then he goes on in this same deposition and actually reverses himself again. So it's worth the time. Spend the time vetting your experts and learning about their experts as well. Thank you all.